Welcome to Actualize, a podcast focused on the intersection of performance, ambition, and mental health. I'm your host, Rob Pantuala. My goal for the show is to not only celebrate success, but also shed light on the challenges and sacrifices that come with ambition. Actualize is brought to you by First Session. Launched in 2019, I started First Session to help you find the right therapist. First Session is purposely designed more like a dating website than a clinical website, as we're completely focused on helping you find the right fit the first time. My team and I interview and vet our partner therapists, so you can simply browse videos, see who you vibe with, and instantly book a session. Check us out at firstsession.com and see why more than 7,000 Canadians have chosen First Session to find a therapist. Today's episode is with Mallory Green. Mallory is the founder of Irene, a company offering accessible and approachable cremation services. Mallory grew up in Aurora, Ontario, and spent five years as an early employee at Wealthsimple before taking the leap and starting her own company. During this conversation, we discuss what it's like to be a female founder and entrepreneur, the challenges faced with raising money to start a company, particularly as a woman, and we talk about Mallory's leadership style her passion to support other women, and we also chat about mental health. Mallory shares her journey on managing her own health and performance as a founder. Please enjoy my conversation with Mallory Green. Okay, Mallory, thank you so much for joining me today. I wanted to jump in and just start at first with your upbringing now that now that you're running your own business, but I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that one of your parents is a funeral director. Is the, does the other one work in hospice care, end of life care? Hospice, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, growing up, I was slightly embarrassed that my dad was a funeral director because when I would tell people, they were very off put by it. I mean, they were, oh, I don't know anyone in that industry. They'd make offside jokes. And so, yeah, I mean, I'd really grown up around the end of life industry overall. I grew up in Aurora, Ontario, small town. Now it's quite big, but at the time, really small town. I went to French immersion, which I think, you know, I I always reflect on if I would put my children through French immersion school eventually. And I think it taught me a lot of discipline. And I I do think there's a lot to be said about your, your brain and development in terms of learning a second language. So really enjoyed that. My French is horrible now, to be honest. But then I went on to study international development at the University of Guelph. I initially actually got into Guelph with sociology because I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to study. And I feel like sociology is kind of like the default when you don't know what you want to do, you you get in for that. If you're interested in humans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, I guess you could argue that I am. But I, yeah, I ended up switching to international development. And I think a big part of that was knowing kind of my limitations, which is I don't actually really enjoy school. I'm not like a big school person. And so if I was going to go through university, which was always really... I would say for my parents, a requirement to go to university, which I have different opinions of for my own children, but I wanted to study something that I was really interested and passionate about. And international development was a great program to be in. Learned so much outside of kind of this tiny little town that I grew up in of, of what was going on in the world and in ways that I could make an impact. And then I graduated and really had no work experience. You know, a lot of people are diving into the co-ops and getting a lot of real work experience, but I had done when I graduated. So I was a little lost when I graduated, but ultimately here I am today. So it all kind of unfolded appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I I was telling you before we started recording that I listened to another interview with you at, on the hard part, like a podcast focus on like Canadian entrepreneurs and tech people. And you were kind of saying that you felt pretty like unprepared and under experienced, I guess, graduating and just like looking for a job. And you mentioned like you taking your first job in tech and, and how that experience was for you. But I guess like my question is more about when did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur or start your own business? When did that kind of bubble up for you? I mean, if you look back, it's funny when I hear other entrepreneurs talk about their upbringing will always say, I, I had a lemonade stand and I was selling comic books. And like, I was not like that at all. I have a very specific personality type, which is I am for, very forward. Um, you know, I'm a child, everyone called me bossy. But honestly, if you asked me when I was younger what I wanted to be, I would have said a mom. Um, and I also really wanted to work at Zellers. 
anyone who knows Zellers, if you're my age, you know. But honestly, now I look at that obsession with Zellers as I actually just was really interested. I liked the cash register and my grandfather ended up buying me a real life cash register. So I didn't have these kind of ambitions growing up. Once again, I've kind of moved through my entire life being open to where I end up. It wasn't until I was spending time at Wealth Simple where people kept saying to me, when are you going to start your own thing? And it's not something I had ever thought of for myself. And it was funny, like even people in leadership at Wealth Simple were saying it to me. And I was like, wait, like, I feel still so fresh and young and I have so much to learn. And in my mind, an entrepreneur and a CEO is someone in their 50s. They probably don't look like me. So it, it wasn't really anything I ever thought for myself, but it was really people pushing me to start looking into what that could be for me. And I think as I spent more time at Wealth Simple, I recognized that I was really talented. Like I really can get shit done and yeah, I'm, I'm a, what's it called, a generalist. So I can do a lot of different things. And I feel like that's a good trait for an entrepreneur and a founder. So over that time, I kind of just started exploring what that would look like for me. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you kind of just like at some point, just like kind of embraced your personality type as you reference like being forward. Like, tell me a little bit more about yeah, that. Did yeah. you go through any phases where you were like trying to like hold your personality in? If you like hurt anyone's feelings or oh, anything? Oh, absolutely. Or, yeah. I mean, I think... Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, my, even to this day, people are like, you're too much. And I was just like, I don't care. But, you know, like the Louis tells a story of when I was about four and my brother's three years older than me. We were at a play place and this kid kept, this little boy kept pushing me. And my brother's like very quiet. And so he kind of was just like not saying anything. And he was getting pushed as well. And my mom said, I, I just turned around and, and screamed at him. And my mom always says, like, I came out the womb a certain way. Like, I just have always been who I am. And I think through high school, you know, it, you could feel very insecure. You're trying to kind of blend in. And then even for university, I mean, I, I've had my fair share of feedback about kind of who I am as a person. But just with, I think, work experience, like when I started working at Wealth Simple, that's when I started to feel really confident and secure in who I am because the people around me saw that in me. And so it, it really honestly has just come with time. I mean, I'm 30 now and I think there's just so much confidence that with, with age, but definitely my entire life I've been told specifically by a lot of men that I can pick too much, but I mean, I am who I am. I can't change that. And I think that that worked to my benefit as a founder. I mean, I always feel like I'm like, I was born to be in this role. So it's exciting. It's, it's had challenges along the way. I love that. I love that. It sounds like your mom has been important and kind of, encouraging you to be yourself is that right i also heard you mention her as a i think you referred to her as your chief emotional officer <laughs> exactly yeah i mean running a business is really difficult there's some days where you're just like totally defeated and my mom my entire life like my mom's my best friend she has been such a huge support people often will say to me like once again how did you become this certain way and my mom will say I just let her be who she is. And like, I think that's brought me to the point I am today. And she's just kind of, I'm very, very different from my mom. Like my mom is, she's friends with everyone. She's very quiet. Like she just is totally, and I'm just like this like wild card of a person. And but she just allowed me to be that way. So my mom is an incredible human and I'm really lucky to have her, but I can't even imagine when I'm a mom and if my daughter's like I am, like the two of us are going to be the scariest people on earth, but it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so your business for those and i'm sure uh, people heard the intro with me talking about irene but maybe we can hear from you like what does your business do and how long have you been doing it yeah so irene focuses really on simplifying the end of life process for families so today we really focus on the funeral aspect and you know when someone dies it's not a conversation that most of us have had uh, we haven't planned for it and often families are thrown into the process of funeral arranging, it's over um, overwhelming, very burdensome, expensive. And so our process, or sorry, our um, what we do today is focused on immediately after a death, kind of supporting families through that funeral arrangement experience. We exist because I think the industry is very outdated. I don't think it serves a lot of consumers' needs today. And I mean, if you look at every other industry that exists, like there has been steps towards innovation and um, accessibility to services. But I mean, the funeral industry has stayed in one specific spot 
for like over a hundred years. Really, it hasn't changed. And so I mean, kind of is just a refresh on the industry. We currently operate in five different provinces and we started about almost three years ago now, which has just been a whirlwind. Like, I can't believe it's been three years. You and I kind of started around the same time. But uh, yeah, no, it's been an incredible journey. And I think, you know, entrepreneurship is really hard, but ultimately when we get feedback from it sounds so cheesy to say like changing people's lives, but honestly, that's that's what we're doing. Like we're really making it a painful experience a little bit easier for families. And so, yeah, we've definitely been lucky enough to serve thousands of families and continue to grow our services. I love that. If I love what you're saying about the feedback too, because I personally, I can get disconnected from what I do pretty easily. I mean, I'm sure yeah. you can too. I literally sit behind a screen and like, talk to people on Slack and you're like, okay, what's actually happening here? And right. you know, you're literally helping families when a loved one dies. Yeah, truly like one of the worst times of their lives, right? And yeah, I mean, you know, you have those really hard days and then I'll get feedback from a family and once again, it's so cheesy, but it makes it worth it because I mean, I think about what both of us are doing, like actually makes an impact in people's lives substantially. So yeah. it's hard. I won't say I did not... I underestimated how hard entrepreneurship is, but you know, you keep just putting one foot above in front of the other and, and make it happen. Yeah. So, and I understand that you quit your last job without fully knowing what you were going to do, right? Mm -hmm. and you knew, and you knew you wanted yeah. to start something, but you weren't, maybe, maybe you had this idea, right? But you weren't necessarily like, you didn't do like the side yeah. hustle thing and like completely kill yourself yeah. before. You know, no, point, point. You, and that's what I was in my mind. I remember my co-founder and I were talking at the time and we were trying to do the nighttime hustle slack thing. I'm, I mean, I'm really an all in or all out person. Like I'm very black and white in that capacity. So I knew, I mean, I spent five years at Wealth Simple. That was a, that's a really long time for a startup. And I knew I would get to a point where it just made sense for me to leave. And I had a moment that I remember I left work and I called my mom and I was like, this is, I'm, I'm done. I gave myself a week. I always think it's important to sleep on decisions, big decisions. I gave myself a week um, and I still felt the exact same way. And so I sat down with Mike first and, and had the conversation about me leaving. And I, I yeah, I had no plans. And like, I just was like, I'm going to cold turkey quit. Uh, luckily, I was in a situation where I could afford to do that. And actually, what ended up happening is initially I was going to take two weeks off of work. And I was like, then I'm going to just dive right into it. And I ended up taking four months off because it just, I was so, I didn't realize how burnt out I was. And after five years, like you just need to take a step back and kind of reflect if you're able to. And so I was lucky enough. My brother got married. My cousin got married. Like I had a lot of different important events and things happening in my life that I could be fully involved in. And I, I'm glad I took that time off because then I dove into Irene and I basically haven't stopped ever since. So really good to do I, I don't know if I would recommend it to everyone to just take a leap like that but everything I've every decision I've made there is thought behind and I kind of have this outlook that like everything ha has always worked out so I'm trying I try to kind of operate in that capacity like I'm always going to figure out a solution it's a great it's a great way to think yeah and that doesn't work for everyone but so far it's worked for me so fingers crossed <laughs> it's so yeah it seems so healthy and so just, just go with it. I've yeah. had a separate conversation with you about your experience kind of getting started and like looking to raise money and that whole process. Maybe you can shed some light on like the stress of trying to find money to start a business so you can maybe pay yourself a tiny bit or maybe you didn't even pay yourself started. But, um, but also being, you know, yeah. there's a lot of discourse, dialogue about being a female founder and the, the challenges that come with that. Like, can you speak to that at all yeah no fundraising is the like worst experience of my life and continues to be i do not enjoy it i think as time goes on you become more confident in what you're doing as a business and so when i enter investor meetings even today i know my job is to describe what we do and it's not up to me if someone agrees with it or is interested or like i can only do so much and so i think my outlook on fundraising has changed significantly whereas when i first first started like i remember i, I called you i think it was in, like the mcdonald's part and when i first started like I, it made me so frustrated when people would give me feedback that didn't make any sense like someone told me the market's too small and i'm like 
everyone died. That doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> and or like I had another investor who told me you should just like hire a few friends and just run a business with your friends. And I was like, that's like slightly demeaning because I'm angry. building like a billion dollar business and not building a lifestyle business with my friends. So and there was a lot of frustration. And, you know, I am I don't want to call myself a control freak. But I like to think I can convince people. And fundraising was really the first experience that I had just like, no, I had to learn with time kind of how to pitch, but I just didn't really have that much control over it. So it was horrible, horrible and continues to be because, as you said, there's the layer of not only am I for a first time, first time founder raising in an environment that no, there's no knowledge of and not a lot of fundraising behind it or sorry, it's your money behind it. I also walk in and I'm a young woman, like I'm 30, but I look a lot younger than I am. Um, people ask, I look here 18. <laughs> and then I have lo- long blonde hair and I have fake nails. And I think there's just like, there's always going to be unconscious bias towards me. And so even I've had to bring myself to acknowledge that, right? Like you have to acknowledge the circumstances that you're in. And I've had a lot of weird experiences, not anything, like even uh, like just inappropriate, I would say, but we're so lucky in terms of who ended up saying yes to us and that we brought on as investors are just incredible people. So everyone that has rejected us, I'm so thankful that the church took this because yeah. I just think ultimately you end up, once again, I like my outlook is I just, I end up where I need to be and, and with the right people. And not to say it hasn't been ex- incredibly stressful, but definitely, yeah, I mean, I've gotten to this point, so I can only keep going. Yeah, yeah. What about some of the challenges specifically about being a female founder or even just like we even talked a little bit, I remember about some of these kind of like investor funds that almost claim to be like just for women and like women supporting women. Like, what do you think about the concept of women supporting women? Is that like a, like, is there a two sides of that Controversial question. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I have a lot to say about it, but, you know, I have to put my PR answer on here. So it's interesting. I'll tell you a really funny story. And this is actually, I'll then talk about some of the women. But we on, and I hope he's listening to this, on LinkedIn, we saw someone who said they had no women in their angel investment portfolio. And they're looking to be connected to really interesting people doing interesting things. And so we reached out and we had a phone call with this person. First of all, this person looked like they had a brush their hair in like four years. And I just think like, I always, as a woman, have to come looking like I am so presentable. Like there's a, there's the double standard there. You know, like I even saw that that Sam Friedman guy yeah, or whatever. Like he was playing him. like- You said that. <laughs> he was playing like video games while he was pitching where I have to be like Barbie robot. Like I'm perfect. You're like this is perfect. Like it's just, it's insane. Like going into those meetings is just insane. I shouldn't use the term insane, but anyway, coconuts, I'll say. And so then you go into them and he goes, well, I don't really like that none of the big funds have invested in you. And in my mind, I'm just like, if we, if that's everyone's outlook, women will never be funded because no one's funding women to begin with, especially the bigger firms. And so then if all the angel investors go and invest in you because no one big is <laughs> just in this constant cycle. And honestly, that experience is a direct reflection of fundraising as a woman. And I remember in that meeting, like, he was like, why don't you get back to me in September and we can kind of reconvene. And I was like, I'm not, we're going to be done fundraising by then. I'm not getting back to you in September. And like, I got to a point now where I have so much confidence in those meetings because you're either in or you're out and also don't disrespect my time. So that I honestly think is such a big reflection of, of fundraising as a woman and yeah, I, you know, like, like I am a girl's girl through and through. Like I am a feminist. I love women. I think my experience with a lot of women's funds today have been that there is so much work involved to get very little capital that it's a disservice to women. So I'll give you an example. We had an investor that we were connected to in Austria. He's kind of an like a small angel fund with a group of people. I hadn't even had a phone call with him. He got the pitch deck and he was like, I'll give you $300,000. Like that was it. I still spoke to him. He was in, it was done. And like at the stage we're at, like if, once again, like 
we have some revenue. I mean, we have a lot of revenue, but we have the validation for what we're doing, but we're not at like the series A level where we have to have a lot of things in order, mm -hmm. right? It was, it was a safe at that point. Whereas I have spoken to some women funds where I really have to jump through hoops just to get $15,000. And once again, I think if we're really talking about moving the needle on funding for women, at the stages that you're, they're investing in, these like smaller angel groups, you're either yes or no. Don't drag people along. Don't say to go reconnect. You're just, you have to be more, yeah, just more straightforward. Because I would say a, a lot of other funds are just yes or no. And it's so much easier for entrepreneurs. But that's been my experience with a lot of the women-based funds. Not to say that they're not supporting women. I mean, they are investing. But I think that... There's just a lot of time wasted. And, and as women, like we already have so many obstacles already. Like, I think that's my biggest piece of feedback today. And I, I hope to see that change. I've actually, I mean, I had a friend who it was, I'm, I'm really telling the dirt for you today. So you. I hope a lot of people listen to this. <laughs> uh, I had a friend that, and I won't name who they are, but I mean, there's not that many in Canada. Like I've definitely been ghosted by some women funds, but the one that really sticks out to me was I spoke to them and I spoke to speak to one of their investment analysts and instead they put an intern on the call with me. Once again, like, don't disrespect my time. This person had clearly never done like an investor call before. So they didn't really even know anything about my business. They hadn't looked at the pitch deck and they didn't even know what questions to ask. So it was a 10 minute call because once again, I'm not really going to waste my time. I get an email a couple of days later saying that you could see where they had just copy pasted my name and because it wasn't like, you know, I have to clear formatting usually when you send an email. <laughs> um, and it said that they usually invest in businesses that are further along. And like, I, my response was, what's further along than 1 million in revenue in one year? Like, there are, like, you can't be further along than that at this point because they were a pre seed fund. Right. So just, you know, it, like, it once again, so I, I gave feedback. My feedback was, like, I can see that you didn't clear this formatting, so I just got a templated response. I wasted my time, and I feel bad for the intern who was thrown into this position. And, like, it's not even accurate. And you know what? Like, I'm in a position where I don't need to... It's not about bur burning bridges. It's ultimately about if no one gives them this feedback, then it will continue as is. And once again, I'm in the role that I am and will eventually invest in women. And I have so much that I'll do differently than what currently exists in the market. So I would be the person that speaks up and <laughs> provides me back because I just think it's not fair. And I, I speak to a lot of founders who have a, a lot of women founders who have a, a lot of hard feedback and time with fundraising. And I think that there's so many ways we can improve it. Yeah. Well said. I'm excited. I'm excited for investor Mallory. That's going to be amazing. While we're on the topic, what about just like, you know, sort of like, the what is your ideal of like the kind of ultimate like female leader like not necessarily investor but kind of like someone who's in a high level executive role or the head of the company what are the kind of traits mm -hmm. that you aspire to be like and or are there any female leaders that you do look up to yeah oh my god are there any female leaders i don't know i don't know if i know the answer to that i mean i just Beyonce, of course. Yeah. Beyonce is, you know, she just has a good reputation. She's so hardworking, but she's so, so kind. And like, I am not, I don't really care about celebrities, but I just think if you can go that long a career and have a good reputation, that's, there's something to be said about that. And I mean, I look at the videos of her, her performances, like who can sing and dance like that? She just, she's so incredible. I'm sure there's a lot of incredible women that I could name, but not Beyonce just always comes because I just love her. In terms of the type of leader that I think I am, you know, I'm a very firm and direct person. I think that's so important as a leader. And, but I also am very empathetic. I can read emotions very well. I'm very in tune with my team. And so I think it's like that kind of like a parent where you have to be firm and make it clear kind of what your position is in a situation but also still be kind and compassionate. And I think both of those things can exist at the same time. What's interesting is as a woman, because I am so firm and very, I don't like these in term blunt, but I'm just clear. I'm a very clear communicator. I don't add fluff to what I say. 
especially as time goes on, I just like don't have time to add black. A lot of men that I've worked along have have made comments, not in our team, but just kind of external vendors and things have made comments about my communication, which once again, I think is a total double standard because if it came from a man, he wouldn't get any feedback. But you get to a point like as a, as a founder and CEO that I, I just can't please everyone. I can stay true to myself and ensure that my team feel supported. But yeah, I think that's really the biggest trait. Patience is a big one and I'm not a patient person. So that has been very, very hard for me because I operate at like 24-7 nonstop. Not everyone does. So kind of expectations from that perspective, I think has been a big learning curve. But work in progress. I mean, I, I'm not perfect. I'll be the first to say that to me on my team. Like I'm learning just like you're learning. But I think if you can be open and honest about that's really all that matters. Yeah, yeah. What you said about the double standard there, I'm, you're, you're, we're kind of finally seeing more conversation about that. Like I think Adam Grant just posted an article in like the New York Times or something about like the double standard of like men and women and, you know, kind of like yeah, coming across as bitchy versus coming across as confident. And, you know, yeah. like that's that whole yeah. thing. Yeah, you know how many times I get called snarky just because I said like just one line? <laughs> like it's like... And that just there's, sounds yeah, like a total it's just there. like the hill that you almost have to keep climbing over and up, right? It's like nonstop, like it's not going away, right? What do you? No, no. And I think once again, I got to a point where I released myself from other people's opinions of me um, yeah. because I know myself so deeply and I know where my heart is. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Like, yeah. so I'm kind of maybe maybe guessing here too much, but I think like if you know, I'm. <laughs> As a man, I know, like if I was a, a woman, like I would be, it's exa- it must be exhausting to, if you want to be firm and, you know, be strong and you're coming up against this kind of opposition all the time, ex- that's completely exhausting, right? Like yeah, you've, yeah. you say you've released yourself from some of that because you know who you are. Like, yeah. So it sounds like there's a lot of kind of like self confidence tied up in that, or at least like, you know, you're, you're mm-hmm. yeah, like self esteem. So, do you think that? Yeah. Do you think that's maybe a missing piece, or like kind of one of the missing pieces for kind of women taking the next step? Yeah, like I think women are taught that, like you know, we shouldn't be overly. I mean, we're literally raised in an environment where it's like the whole Barbie movie, which is like just be a specific way, like don't be overconfident, uh, don't be cocky, like all of these things, and. And so we're just told to be less, right? And as I said, my entire life, I've been a very specific way. But I mean, I would always, I probably always cared about what people thought of me, especially if someone would say something that wasn't true. Um, And I've had experiences like that over the years where I've had people, once again, external people that we've kind of worked alongside that have said things about me that aren't true. And I remember like the very first incident of that happening, like I was so upset. I called my co-founder. I was so upset about it. And I was like, they're saying this. And like, that's just not true about me. And well, he's like, yeah, it's not true about you. So like, we need to move on. And I think once again, it's come with AIDS and time where I can't preoccupy myself with that. I can be who I am and what people think about me. I just, I don't really care. I only care about who I love, what they think about me. Like my mom, my dad, my brother, my friends, et cetera. But I think definitely like confidence is built over time. And I still have moments where I kind of, I think I kind of shrink a little bit, like, especially even going into investor meeting where I'm kind of like, okay, pull back a little bit, or I don't feel as confident. Like, I, I mean, every day there's times where I'm not feeling confident, but you know, it, you know, people, women always say that they feel that way. And then they get in a room with a bunch of like CEOs or leaders and they're like, oh, like you're just a, you're just a human and you're not perfect. And you're not the smartest person in the room. I can be this too. Like I can be a CEO too. And I think, yeah, I mean, just more business people you meet, you're just like, oh, wait, I think I might actually be a better business person. <laughs> so, yeah, it just, it's come with meeting people and time and, and all of those factors, but I still have moments of uh, that insecurity for sure. Because people will say, people will give you feedback that make you insecure, but you just have to bounce back. That's great. That's, <laughs> it's so interesting that, yeah, it's just the kind of, what can just live in your own mind, right? Like what can kind of hold you back? Oh, for um, sure. It's like uh, imposter syndrome, right? But I remember like years ago, we had a woman come in to all, to speak to all the women at Wealth Simple about imposter syndrome. And she said like people who don't have imposter syndrome basically are like psychopaths. Like 
like actually his psychosis. So that's like, it's normal if you're a high performing person to have imposter syndrome and to feel not only confident and to like reflect and maybe even judge yourself. Like, I think there's something to be said about being so in tune with yourself and wanting better, like constantly pushing myself to be better. Because I think people who don't, that eventually backfires. I mean, a lot of the tech people who just, they get like so beyond themselves and then it, it all comes crumbling down. I think it's good to stay kind of aware. <laughs> yeah, not be like a psycho who is super confident all the time. Yeah, you're here. That's a bite, even fight a psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe to close out the topic in your in the interview I referenced before in the other podcast, you mentioned that if you had kind of like unlimited money, then you start a foundation for supporting women. Yeah. How would you support women with that foundation? What kind of things would you do? Yeah, I mean, I think, and once again, my PR team is going to not like me saying this. I look at what is happening in the U.S. And I think, we are taking such far steps back for women globally. You know, I think what's so important for women is like education and access to, or just like reproductive rights. And like even think about like menstrual, like your menstrual cycle and ensuring of access to tampons or, and all of these things that essentially end up having women in a really good spot by the time they enter the workforce and, and can contribute to society. I mean, I don't know what the stat is, but I think it's the world more higher percentage of women i think it is i think so yeah but like half of the population we're doing a huge disservice to and once again I, we're, we're taking major steps back to um, women's rights and so when i'm saying like you know i can't outline specifically what that would look like but i think there are so many steps in terms of education that could support women in, in getting what they need to be great members of society and not just be a womb that carries children. I mean, if they want, I'm a feminist. So if you want to do that, I love that for you. But if you want to be a CEO, I will also help support you in that. You know what I mean? Like people often say like, am I a feminist? I don't know if I am, but a feminist is just like, you believe women should be able to be whatever they want to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe. And so, yeah, I would look at it from, kind of the education, reproductive rights aspect, I would say. It, those are topics that are very important to me. So when I sell my business for a billion dollars, that's that's what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. I'm very excited for that too. <laughs> I'd love to, is there any times when you're like deflated and like lose motivation? Like where what drives you? Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> all the time. Right, all the time. What drives me? Well, you know, like having a bigger team now, it just depends, like they all depend on me to keep going. And I remember I saw a conversation with Joanna Nix and she said like, she went into a team meeting and she, and this is probably not even going to be appropriately paraphrased, but she basically said that she was in her car and she was feeling a bit defeated, but she knew like as the leader, she had to go in and like her job is to pump everyone up and get them motivated and excited about what they're doing. And so sometimes they just have to put on a face and approach the day like that in terms of like I am a workhorse so like I mean I work basically everyone's always like what are you doing this week I'm like probably work and I have the balance that I need like I have a nice work-life flow I would say but I think I'm so deep into this now in terms of almost three years in and I have people who you know some of those investors who didn't believe that I could do it they definitely motivate me I'm like, and that's how I'm driven. It's like when people say, you know, when people say like, oh, I don't know if, well, if this will work, that's like really what drives me for it. I'm like, I will show you that yeah. this is going to yeah. be a billion dollar business. But like, you know what? I am very, I know myself. So if I'm having, I really work with the like ebbs and flows of motivation. So if I'm having a day where I'm just like not feeling with it, I'm just going to, I'm going to run with it. I Maybe I'll do something like like more admin type things that are like putting a lot of brain power because then I have times where like I work like full day and I'm just full speed and I'm doing so many things, right? I don't think you can operate at 200% every single day. I think you have to just kind of know yourself and run with that. But, oh, I mean, every week I have moments where I'm like, oh gosh. And then sometimes I just go to bed and really wake up the next day and do it all over again. Like just understanding my limits, put on some sex in the city and it's a different. yeah yeah 
you have to be, and you have to be so kind to yourself as an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, Kim was the person who told me that athletes really like they have recovery and rest time. Like that's so critical to what they do on a day to day basis. And I've, I've dated athletes and like, I've never seen people take rest and recovery so intensely and entrepreneurs should be no different than that. Like we should be having those times where that's like, you're doing a sport, like you're risking a 500 kilometer dash or whatever. Like it's like 500 kilometers. Yeah. So I think it's really important to be aware of that and, and take the time, take a step back every so often. It definitely brings more creativity and, and thought when you take a step back and, and just have some time to just chill and, and then kind of get back at it. Yeah. Yeah. On the note of resting and motivation, what are the other, uh, maybe, I mean, I know there's more conversation now about like mental health and I mean, in general, mental health, but uh, being a founder, yeah. how has your, yeah, how's your mental health been in the last few years? And have you like invested yeah. more in that than before? Or have you like, where do you hold that in level of like your performance as a founder? Yes. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think like as a human, I've always been a high functioning, anxious person. I, and I didn't really actually know that not everyone feels anxious until I was at Wealth Simple and I was talking to one of my coworkers and she's like, I'm describing how I always have a pit in my skin. She's like, you know, like not everyone has that. Like you need to probably speak to someone. And I was like, wait, not everyone's anxious 24 seven. I literally just thought that was the case. I mean, anxiety definitely is a family thing. I think a lot of people in my family have anxiety and I describe as high functioning because I don't have like social anxiety. I don't. I don't, I'm not like paralyzed by doing anything. I just cannot stop. Like I wake up and I'm like, I have to do 400 things today. And by the end of the night, I'm like, I did not do enough. So it was just like constant, constant. And I think that being an entrepreneur and a founder brought that to light even further. I mean, it's such a high pressure position to be in. And I, I got to a point actually this March where I was like, I think this is really healthy for me. I probably need to, think of a solution here. So I actually spoke to my friend who's a family doctor and I said, I've been thinking about trying um, anxiety medicine, Ciprolex, and I just want your thoughts on it because everyone on the internet, it makes me terrified. Like everyone's like, you're a zombie, you will feel like crap, right? All of these horrible things. And I was like, oh, I cannot afford to be a zombie as an entrepreneur. And so she was like, Mallory, like some of the loudest people on the internet are going to have bad experience, but there's a lot of people like it's a very common medicine to be on. So you should just try it out. So I actually went on Felix Health and this is a free shout out to Felix Health. Nice. And I spoke to one of their practitioners and I got, I got a prescription for it. And I had throughout the years, I've, I've done therapy. I've done both like well personally, but also through kind of a coach, um, like a professional coach that has the psycho psychologist aspect of it. But I think you know, modern medicine exists for a reason. And it, I didn't feel like it was bringing me to the point that I wanted to be. So got the prescription. I had basically no side effects when I started it. And to this day, like, it's just been smooth sailing. And that, it's funny, I was the biggest concern I had would be that I would like lose motivation or I'd be less productive because, you know, that anxiety really fueled me. But what ended up happening was I'm like so at peace now that I'm way, way more productive than I've ever been. And at the end of the day, I can be confident that I've done my job and I'm going to wake up again and do it the next day. So it's honestly been an incredible experience for me. I mean, you know, I've had a lot of people that I told, I mean, I haven't told a lot of people, but like the stigma of, oh, well, if you should get off of it and take this. Or, you know, like it's just a short term thing to get in through this period of your life it's not for me. Like I, I went into it knowing that, you know, if it didn't work out for me, that's okay. I'll continue to try other aspects or other avenues. But for me, it's just, it's a tool in my toolbox. Like it helped me tremendously. I'm so happy. Like I just feel so much lighter. I don't wake up with a pit in my stomach anymore. So yeah, I think once again, like that was the biggest thing I recognize that if you're, if you get into the position of being an entrepreneur and a CEO and a founder, you know, a lot of your strength is only going to increase. And so making sure that you're taking care of your mental health is just so, so critical. And maybe that evolves over time. Like maybe it's just 
you're speaking to a therapist and maybe you consider medicine or meditation or all these different avenues, but like just being really in tune with your body is so critical and not being scared to, to ask for help because I mean, I hope by sharing this, like people know that there's really big success stories and there's nothing wrong. Like I am, I'm a great sounder and a great CEO. And I also do you know, have anxiety. That's fine. Those all, those things are all great. So yeah, I, I'm happy to share that here because I think I wish I had heard this sooner because I think that I was in a spot that I didn't need to be for a while, but now I'm just thriving through life with my super life. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Do you mind? We don't have to go super deep into it, but what like what were some of the, you know, really difficult times that made you kind of yes. go a step further to seek help? Like what were the kind of symptoms or what did it feel like? Honestly, it was fundraising. Like I think once again, like just the you know, it's funny you finish fundraising and then it's like, okay, start having conversations for the next one. And I just I don't now I would say, especially being on medicine, I like I pitched someone last week and I was like smooth sailing. I did a great job. I killed it. It doesn't bother me as much, but a bunch of things happened in the business in terms of like we had some employee like going up and, and we had fundraising stuff and all of these things were happening at once. And it, it was just like, okay, I'm going to take a step back and just think about myself because I can't support the business if I'm not supporting myself ultimately. So I really think it was just like a build up over three years. I'm sure that I also had like an element of depression too, just because like, I mean, you know, the winter's so rough already. And this was kind of January through March. And get in a mode when you're an entrepreneur where you're just like, I feel like I'm just like spinning my wheels every day. Like it's just, you know, like I'm not taking, I'm not taking steps that I need to. And I'm kind of really in the weeds of operations. And so I think it was all of those things in combination that made me just think, you know what? I am, I'm going to do this. And funny enough, I also put my dog on Prozac, which is very controversial for a lot of people. I mean, Prozac exists for dogs. He's all very nature. And him and I now are living our best lives. So he's chilled out. I'm chilled out. We are, we are very happy. So good to hear. That's great. Do you view yourself as a founder and entrepreneur? Like, do you just, maybe, maybe this is a bad question because you're just like so immersed in it, but do you view this phase? I mean, you've talked about like, post exit like doing kind of what you want to do like do you view this as kind of yeah a, more of a shorter term kind of thing for you like a sprint and you just kind of gotta keep your head how do you think about this or do you think you'll like just continue yeah. like finding new opportunities like how do you maybe, maybe again maybe this is a hard question to no answer. that's a good question I think like I I'm always like I don't know what will happen with Irene in the sense of where we end up and do I run this for the rest of my life potentially do we sell it potentially I mean who knows once again I just go with the flow of my life I take one day at a time but I think as an entrepreneur like my co-founder and I always say that we'll continue to build businesses together I think I like I'm in my element as I said I feel that this is where I'm meant to be I always have ideas like it's funny people approach me and they're like do you have ideas and I'm like constantly because every day when I interact with people I'm thinking like it's horrible because they're telling me like something in their life that's a pain point. And I'm like, how could I build a business around this? So, you know, I'm that type of person. Like, I just think there's so many cool things and that have yet to be built and that can help people in their day-to-day life. So definitely I will always be an entrepreneur. And as I said, I mean, I'm taking it day by day because I mean, the world is, it's, it's, there's a lot going on right now. And as an entrepreneur, I think especially the last year for a lot of people, it's been challenging. And so I'm just, I'm seeing what happens, but I'm definitely excited about the future because I think once again, I have a lot of ideas of what I'll do next. So, yeah, yeah. But I'm focused. I'm focused right now because I, you know, I can't get distracted by everything that's in the back of my mind. Even people will be like, you should build this. And I'm like, I don't have heart. You know, I, it's ironing right now and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You mentioned your co-founder. How has that been? I know it could be a pain point and breaking point for a lot of businesses when there's a co-founder relationship. I've also kind of heard you speak to your relationship separately before, but um, yeah, tell me about more about how you support one another and like how you establish this relationship. Yeah. And you know, once again, time, I always say time is so critical. So 
Phaedra and I were introduced by a mutual friend as two people who wanted to build a business. Um, so we met for coffee one day. We talked about Irene or the concept kind of of Irene and the industry. And we just took steps towards kind of exploring it together. We've known each other now for about five years. We have an incredible relationship. And I recognize that we're very lucky because I, as you said, some people can have very challenging relationships and it's so hard because there's so much stress involved. And you need someone who's equally pulling their weight. So like there are so many elements of, of Faisal and I meeting and becoming co-founders. Once again, came down to time and connections and all of these elements that I'm very grateful for. Faisal is very different from me. And I think that's why it works so well. He's definitely a lot more chill than I am. He has different skill sets in terms of kind of how he thinks about problem solving. And like I would say, he's more of a numbers person, more of a data person. And, and I'm more kind of operations, high level, big picture. So we, you know, we work incredibly well together. And I mean, we've never had any problems, which is, I hate, you know, when couples say like, we don't ever fight. And that's just like, okay, well, that's toxic. Um, him and I just have the same communication style where we just were honest, very, very open with each other. If he's annoying me or said something I don't like, I'll just tell him and vice versa. And then we kind of move on because ultimately we have the same vision and goal at the end of the day. And so... And there's always so much going on around us that we're very aligned with kind of what we're doing day to day. So then it's been really great. And when I, even when I went on anxiety medicine, like I took, Faisal was one of the first people I told. And I mean, he's, he literally would support and help you two or six. So yeah, no, it's been really good. But I think having different, per, like, I, could, I don't know if I could work with someone like myself. If there was two of us, I'm not sure it would work out very well, but yeah, it's been great. And as I said, we'll continue to build businesses as we, as time goes on. That sounds super healthy. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Good for you for yeah. holding on to that. And yeah, I'm sure you do things to nurture that relationship. Yeah. I wanted to use the final segment to actually talk a little bit more about like related to your business, death <laughs> and dying. And so you, so you're one of your parents is a funeral director. The other one's in hospice. And may, may, maybe for those who don't, aren't that familiar, like, what is hospice care? What is, what is that? So hospice care, and you know, it's so interesting. A lot of people think palliative care and hospice care are the same, and they're absolutely not. So if you often say to someone um, that they should seek like palliative support, they're like, oh, so I'm, I'm dying now? And that's not the case. You could have palliative care your entire life. Um, really, palliative care is supporting you in pain management and ensuring that you can live your best life despite having some type of illness or terminal Ill illness or whatever that looks like. Hospice is different because hospice is where you go at the end of your life. I, I've spoken to people before who they went to hospice. One of our investors, she's like, I was sitting outside of it and I was terrified to go in. So I had this idea of what a hospice would be. But a hospice is, is so, they're so nice. Like they are built like a home. They have kitchens. They have support dogs. They have music and all of this different things. So it's really like, it's creating this beautiful environment for the final days of your life. Um, so my mom, she's a, she's a hospice nurse. It's a very hard nurse to be, but I think she, and even kind of how I look at my role in the end of life is like, I think it's an honor to bring people through that stage of their life. I mean, death is just a part of life. It's not like this thing that we can cure or um, change. It's, it's just, I mean, our bodies are literally, they know how to die. So I really think it's an incredible, it's a quite incredible concept. And fun fact, we do not have enough processes, specifically in Ontario, but I'm sure Canada wide, for the amount of people who will need end of life support. So side business, friend, because we need more hospices. I mean, it's so critical. And as I said, it's, it really provides a great experience for end of life. So I hope that. Once again, kind of in my work, I can bring more awareness to the tools and services that we need as time goes on. Because right now, for our population, like, it, yeah, we don't have what we need in place. But yeah, I mean, I hope that everyone ending your life in a hospice or spending the end of your life in a hospice, I think is just, is so, so incredible. So I hope anyone who can experience it would definitely would, would do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think people are really afraid of it. I've, I mean, I even, again, think we've talked about this separately <clears throat> reading some books about end of life and one in particular called being mortal that i really really love top books okay. uh, a lot of the research and science says that when you actually like stop trying to like treat everything in like a hospital you're trying to kind of 
let's say you have like mm-hmm. cancer or something and trying to do like chemo or trying to do whatever you can to kind of fight whatever disease is kind of starting to take over. And if you transition into more of the, I think the palliative model is more about relieving suffering, right? Like kind of promoting comfort, right? So you're going to, yeah, and that includes like the other things like social and like even people talk about like in a hospice, like there's no like beeping machines everywhere because like beeping, like anxiety inducing in a hospital. And yeah, a yeah. lot of this data says that you actually live longer because it's right. like the diseases don't progress as fast because you're in a such better environment. Yeah. Like. Um, yeah. I find it's really yeah. fascinating and I'm personally looking at, you know, kind of learning about the, some of the treatments for like end of life anxiety around psychedelics and things like that, which seems very mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Extend life if you relieve some of that anxiety and give people some new perspective on the end. There are, was there like a documentary or something about this recently? There's quite Someone a few who... things popping up. Yeah. yeah. So there's, yeah. There, there's... I think someone who used psychedelics, maybe in the U.S. and kind of, it was, he was in hospice and he like documented it all. I think that's what it was. Could, could have been. There's some yeah. stuff on Netflix. Um, there's a couple of documentaries called Dosed, Dosed 1 and Dosed okay. 2, which are Canadian. Uh, Health okay. Canada has trials for end of life psilocybin use right now. Um, oh, wow. But yeah, there's some really interesting stuff happening there. But yeah, I, I, next, my next query question is just around like what have you learned around people's the people who are like kind of coming to Irene I'm sure it's some folks that are kind of pre-planning their own you know Mm -hmm. funerals end of life yeah but I'm sure it's a lot of people who are trying to plan it for folks for their parents or loved ones that way right so what if like you know I've been in sales before selling to people or you know trying to educate people on products but what have you learned about like how to best care for people who like yeah yeah no that's a good question and I think once again it kind of Irene is built around the opposite of what the funeral industry does and, and you know ultimately the funeral industry is a business right so I've, I've been asked the question before of how you approach being a business and making money in an industry that's kind of in the end of life it, it, I think to a lot of people there may be like stigma around that but I think, I mean, for me, I believe I can build a successful business and provide really great experiences for families simultaneously. And I think that's reflected through our Google review and the feedback that we receive. And so it's really at the end of the day, addressing the biggest pain point. While some people do pre-plan for end of life, it's very few. So I think about 15% of Canadians have put their end of life wishes in place. Um, I mean, even our organ donation, right? Like while most Canadians would say, I, I believe in organ donation, they aren't signed up to be organ donors. And so there's, I mean, there's a total lack of having those conversations and even demonstrating kind of what quality of life that you want at the end of your life, right? I mean, putting in writing for me, it's like, if I can't like speak and if I can't eat, I don't really need to be here, right? And putting those wishes in writing is so crucial. So I think when families find us, we had someone once say that she was calling a bunch of different funeral homes and she spoke to one of our funeral directors and she just felt like they, like, she, I think mean, her words were like, they got me. Like, they they have me. I'm in good hands. And our goal is to remove a lot of the burden of that experience from their lives. So one is like not having to go in person as soon as you love someone, speak to Spain, sign all this paperwork that's repetitive, be showing the specific urn that's like, has specific lighting so that you think it looks nicer than the one that's in the basement in the darkness because it's cheaper. You know, all these decisions that I just don't think it's the word. I don't think it's just a great expectation that to have of people during this time. Um, making it more affordable, I think, is a big piece of what we do and ensuring that people feel that we're being very transparent about our pricing because that doesn't really exist in the industry. And then education. Ultimately, I think that As a business, what we can do is educate people on what their choices are. I feel like just happy if we can just do that, whether they choose our services or not, because there just isn't any education out there about all the different options and even how to memorialize people, right? Like people don't know that you can do diamonds and you can send remains to space and you can scatter them and you can turn them into stones. And like there's so many unique things that people can do to memorialize people and kind of continue that grief journey so it's really supporting people at the end of the day you know I have 
mixed feelings about grief being in the, this is a side note, but I have to say this in this podcast. I have mixed feelings about grief being in the mental health category because I don't know if I believe that grief is mental health. I think grief is just grief. And it's, you know, as a normal experience that we all go through. And so I think like, I mean, when you look at a lot of people talk about like the five stages of grief and I mean, that doesn't really exist. I mean, everyone grieves differently. There's different types of, of grievers. And it's, it's interesting, like having a very different approach to end of life, I think has been critical. And as we were talking about reading a lot of books, even kind of as people get diagnosed with terminal illness in the stages that their families go through in terms of conversations and play, all of that has really helped me in providing a service that I think just supports families in the way that they need. And I kind of think at the beginning of this conversation, we talked about the feedback that you can get from people and really demonstrates that you made an impact and you helped them during that time. But as long as we can continue to do that, I will be happy. I would love to get into the world of supporting them kind of in that first year because there's so many things that people don't know about what happens after somebody dies. The last thing I'll just say is that what often happens when somebody uses our services, what we call at need, so someone has died and, and they require our services, what happens is the people reflect on their own wishes. So there's this natural transition into pre-planning that occurs. And I think, once again, it's, if we can get people to kind of think about what they want for the end of their lives and how they want to be, that's a major win because ultimately, as a society, we need to be having more of those conversations. Yeah, I love that. That's incredible. I've witnessed my father-in-law's passing and yeah a lot of chaos could ensue if there's not a great plan in place mm -hmm. and it's like so yeah yeah it's just like so thoughtful for people to do it themselves be inside of leaving it up to yeah. their loved ones right i mean it's hard to do obviously yeah um but it's like what an amazing gesture like generous awesome is there anything else that you wanted to share on the topic of mental health being an entrepreneur running a business in the death industry. I mean, I can do a lot of good information today. So yeah. I hope a lot of people listen to this and enjoy it. And if I don't really have any more to share, I mean, I think it's, you know, I'm on TikTok and I always see people saying like, day in the life of an entrepreneur. And I'm like, they like go to Pilates and then they go up to eat and then they're with their boyfriend. And I'm like, where, <laughs> what point do you work? I think sometimes social media cannot be a reflection of entrepreneurship. And I think both of us know that. So if you're in it and you're like, why is my life not looking like this? I think that that's just not a true reflection of building a business. And it's hard. It's very, very hard. But as I say, approach each day, put one foot in front of the other. And yeah, just be kind to yourself because it is very challenging. But, you know, hopefully everything we're doing pays off in the end. <laughs> yeah, then we'll, there's still so much to come. So I appreciate you having me and Hopefully I provided some wisdom. I don't know. We'll, well see. If, at the very least you inspired me. So thank you for crushing it and uh, just being <laughs> a powerhouse in the entrepreneur category. So thank you very much. And thank uh, you. Thank yeah, you. so where's me. Irene at and where can people find you? So Irene spelled E-I-R-E-N-E, -E, which means a state of peace. People always say, where did that name come from? And Irene really is a reflection of what we want our families to feel when they're interacting with our services. So everywhere, it's just Irene. So Irene.ca, Instagram, Irene, Twitter, Irene. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, my name is Mallory Green, which you'll probably see at the title of this. Mm -hmm. I'm always happy to connect specifically with women founders. <laughs> that makes it sound like I don't want to speak to men, but you know, women take more of a priority in my life. So yeah, no, happy to connect with anyone and whether it's just provide feedback or just be kind of someone to listen to the struggles of entrepreneurship. I'm always happy to do that. Love that. I love that invitation. I uh, hope people take you up on that. So thanks, Mallory. Yeah. And I hope you have a great afternoon and real pleasure speaking with you. So thanks again for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Actualize podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode, as well as all other episodes at firstsession.com slash podcast. If you like this podcast, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.